Welcome to this edition of Classic Drummer Interviews and today um, we're going to talk about Hal Blaine and the Wrecking Crew. This is the book Hal Blaine and the Wrecking Crew. It was written in 1990 by Hal Blaine. It's an autobiography of Hal's and it's, it's a Hal Blaine kind of week this week. Uh, last week uh, Hal passed away on March 11th at the age of 90 years of age. He's given many interviews since his retirement. And the interesting thing is, Hal's interviews don't change much. There's some really good ones out there in podcast form. Um, there's a podcast I listen to called I'd Hit That, and I'd recommend you give that a try if you're, if you're a podcast kind of person. Um, Dave of I'd Hit That uh, interviewed Hal Blaine three or four years ago. Got a great interview with Hal Blaine. Very different than most of the interviews you get from the magazines. My first Hal Blaine interview was from Modern Drummer Magazine. And I believe it was in 1981 or 82. And I was trying to find that issue of Modern Drummer because I lost it in college. Uh, there were two issues I lost in college. One was the first Carl Palmer issue. And the other one was the Hal Blaine issue. And I, I don't know where it went. I ended up rebuying the Hal Blaine issue in the 90s when eBay first came on board and somebody was selling that issue on eBay and I picked it up. And I picked up the Carl Palmer issue from the same guy who was selling his magazines. It's kind of a funny story there. But the Hal Blaine issue of Modern Drummer, he was talking mostly about his time with John Denver a singer he toured with in the 70s exclusively and there was a cut there was a picture of Hal on the cover of Modern Drummer magazine with the kit that had kind of a Native American motif on it and it was a kind of a three piece kit with a 13 16 bass drum it had kind of like Native American kind of painting on it and then he had a set of congas over here that he played sometimes um, so he wasn't touring with the big Hal Blaine uh, Octoplus kit, or as he called it, the Monster kit. That was really what his name for it was. The other interview that's of significance from that same time period was The Big Beat by Max Weinberg. And Max Weinberg is the, uh, was the third drummer for Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, and the longest lasting drummer in the E Street Band. And Max wrote an incredible book in the 80s with some interviews of some of the greatest drummers and called The Big Beat. It is out of print for a long time. I picked up a copy of this in a used bookstore one day and it's classic, the, the names of the guys are in this. Of course, at the top is Hal Blaine, but it was Hal Blaine, Dino Danelli, DJ Frontana from Elvis fame, Russ Kunkel, Ringo Starr, Charlie Watts, Dave Clark, Kenny Jones, Earl Palmer, Bernard Purdy Pretty, Bernard Pretty Purdy, um, Roger Hawkins from Muscle Shoals fame, Jim Keltner, LeVon Helm, and Johnny B. So these are the guys, actually it's Johnny B on the cover, which always cracked me up because I never understood why he put Johnny B even in, the, in this classic drummer thing, but Johnny B was a Detroit drummer. I think he must have had a huge influence on Max because he was his first guy almost for the... Um, for the conversations with the greatest rock drummers, the Big Beat. So if you can get your hands on a copy of this, you're going to be reading some classic um, information about these guys. So Hal wrote his own book in 1990, Hal Blaine and the Wrecking Crew. Um, in this book, besides the multitudes of pictures that are in here, and I may scan a few of these in when I do this, and I may not, um, there was an incredible listing of hits that he played on and it's pages of discography and these are just the top 10 recordings of the years his recording career started in 1959 with an artist called Jan and Dean and he played on a song called Baby Talk which was number 10 in 1959 he played on Can't Help Falling in Love Elvis Presley a number one hit in 1961 he played on Herb Albert in the Tijuana Brass, the famous song, uh, Lonely Bull, okay, 1962. In 1963, he played on the Ronettes, Be My Baby, and Be My Baby is the classic Hal Blaine, okay, because the classic Hal Blaine is... Okay. 
So, I mean, he made that famous for the Ronettes, and he made them famous with that hit, uh, drum beat. Um, he also played on Sam Cooke's Another Saturday Night. Um, then he started recording with the Beach Boys in 1963. Uh, 1963 saw a lot of hits. For everybody from the Beach Boys to Jan and Dean again, the Crystals, Bobby Darren, um, and Elvis Presley again. In 1964, he, he recorded with Jay and the Americans. Uh, Come a little bit closer it was a hit for Jay and the Americans. Everybody loves somebody, Dean Martin. He recorded with the Beach Boys again. I get around. Um, he had a number one, I think, a record of the year with a song called Ringo by Lauren Green. I'll tell you who they gave, they gave, uh, uh, you know, records of the year to, to interesting artists back in the 60s. But Lauren Green was the guy from Bonanza, if I'm not mistaken. So, 1965 was A Taste of Honey, Hal, Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass. Um, record of the year that year. I believe that was the delineation of the, the star. I think it was record of the year. Um... I mean, the, the list goes on, the number of top ten hits he played on. These are only top tens. Forget about all the records he played on. Um, it's just incredible. When you, start to, when you start to think about what Hal Blaine did and who he played for and what he played on, Simon and Gar Garfunkel's Mrs. Robinson. Um, he played on Bridge Over Troubled Water. Um, so many, so many hits. Uh, Played on the Fifth Dimension hits, Up, Up, and Away. Uh, so many, so many great hits here. Um, then he started playing with the Carpenters. So how Blaine, we, we lost, we lost a great, we great, great drummer, one of the greatest drummers, uh, one of the biggest influences on my playing. Um, he was the studio drummer to be emulated. Um, all the guys that came up in the studios after Hal and Earl Palmer. I'll give Earl Palmer right along with Hal. Those two guys were the studio mainstays in LA and Hal was the more vocal and of course um, the one that basically promoted himself in the 90s to write a book about himself which got the whole Wrecking Crew concept out there. Um, he took the Wrecking Crew name which was given to him by Phil Spector it's what he called these guys, and the reasoning for the Wrecking, wrecking Crew name was these guys are going to wreck the way we record was the way the, the guys in the shirts and the ties felt about the young guys coming in with the jeans and the t-shirts recording albums in the 60s. Things were changing. But by the 70s when you had your Russ Kunkels, your Jim Keltners, your Jim Gordons, um, the next crop of studio guys, Jeff Picaro, Hal Blaine was already a legend at that point, so was Earl Palmer. So you're talking about the master himself. He made it to 90. Um, great, huge influence on my playing. That's all I can say about that. Um, I would recommend for classic interviews of Hal Blaine is reading his biography and finding the big beat. Um, he did do a few other ones. I think he might have done one for the, a magazine called Classic Drummer Magazine, which is really hard to find that too. Um, but there wasn't a lot in print with Hal, I mean, MD only featured him one time. One time did he get press. Of course, he had retired at that point. By the mid-80s, he had retired and stopped playing, pretty much. Um, so a studio drummer's lifespan was 20 years, give or take. Of course, guys like Jim Keltner have been in it since the 60s, and there's still guys, there's still guys recording for people. But the, the world of the studio has changed a lot. Um, when I was in college in the, eight, the late, uh, early 80s, basically I wanted to be a studio drummer. I saw a career and I saw an opportunity there, you know, to be the guy playing on records. That was what I wanted to do. So it was kind of a goal of mine. Um, I saw it actualized for me in the 90s playing on some, some songs in town in New Jersey, getting a chance to record in Nashville and realizing I wasn't Nashville quality studio level. level. That was a big... That was a big dream to kind of drop in, at 30 years old, but you know what? It was the right dream to drop for my life, but I never stopped wanting to do it. So I would record all through the 90s, and eventually, the end of the 90s, I would start my own studio just so I could learn how to record, and just so I can get the feel of recording and that process of the creative process of working with an artist and coming up with 
drum parts. So Hal Blaine came up with so many great drum parts, and they were very creative. Um, this weekend I've recorded two Hal Blaine songs. I have an old cover of a Carpenter's tune that I may re, um, refile. I have some takes of that that I haven't used and I may actually upload, but I've got two songs I did. One was called Never My Love by The Association and it's got brush playing. And the second one was a Glenn Campbell song. Somebody asked me to do a Glenn Campbell song, so this is, cut, this is actually working for two things. It was a number one hit for Glenn Campbell called Wichita Lineman. And it, it used brushes, but I couldn't get the vibe on the brushes as cool as with the sticks, so I kind of stuck to a sticks um, kind of version of it. But um, Hal switches the sticks halfway through the tune, too. I don't know how that happens. It may be a tape splice. But um, it didn't sound like an, an easy kind of switch. But anyhow... It's Hal Blaine week for me, so this is my little tribute to Hal Blaine, the master. Thank you, Hal, for all the years of, uh, uh, of, of playing and influencing us. And I hope that you are in a place of peace and you're playing with the big rock and roll band in the sky. Thanks a lot, Hal. And thanks for watching Classic Drummer Interviews. Have a great day. Bye.